Good morning and welcome to St. Paul's Lutheran Church of Hopkins, Michigan. Those of you are obviously here present and accounted for on site. And those who this week we have are on time. Our theme for today, the third Sunday in the season of Lent, is in spite of our sinfulness, our Lord offers us salvation and deliverance. Look for that theme to be carried out in our lessons today. I also would like to direct your attention to the three worship thought. I did so in Bible class this morning. Uh, make sure that you read that, because I'm sure that when you get done reading that, that you'll want to cut that out and put that in the refrigerator. Um, it reminds us of the Lord's patience, but he is never indulgent. He's never an enabler. So um, just keep that in mind as we keep the theme for today. The Lord offers us salvation and delivers us by us. He's never indulgent or an enabler. Let's open our words this morning with the opening hymn, hymn number 108, Jesus, Refuge of the Weary. Asking him in the name of 
of our Savior Jesus to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a Exodus. 
Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why, the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hands of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you, and this will be a, the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. For you have brought the people out of Egypt. You will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. Here ends our first lesson. We continue the path of our worship with the Psalm of the Day. That is Psalm 85. You'll find it on page 80, 97. And as is our custom on this particular Sunday, let's read the Psalm together. Ignoring the refrain, but joining in the glory of pottery at, at its conclusion. Psalm 85, please, ladies and You showed favor to your land, O Lord. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all their sins. Show us your unfailing love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will listen to what God the Lord will say. He promises peace to his people, his saints. Surely his salvation is near those who fear him, and his glory may dwell in our land. Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and his Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our second lesson, recorded in the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 10, verses 1 through 13, St. Paul reminds us that <coughs> Some of the chosen Israelites fell into grievous sins and lost God's free gift of salvation. If we trust in our own effort to stand firm in the faith, you and I are also going to fall. The Lord, however, provides the strength we need to overcome every temptation. He provides that in His Word. He provides that in His sacraments, particularly the sacrament of Holy Communion. We turn our attention to 1 Corinthians.
Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 13. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud, and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, but they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. And that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test the Lord as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble, as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples, and were written down as warnings for us, on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. So, if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Here ends our second lesson. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in Him may have eternal life. We continue with the, the Gospel lesson, chapter 13 of St. Luke's Gospel, verses 1 through 9. Tragedies and hardships can, can strike anyone at any time. They are simply reminders that this world is infected with sin. I'm going to make mention of that in the sermon meditation this morning. The Lord is patient with us sinners. But if and when we continue to resist his will for our lives, we will be cut down in judgment, which is the greatest tragedy of all. Luke chapter 13, let's arise for the reading of the gospel. Thank you. 
and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. That's Romans chapter 3, verses 23 24. Long gospel in two verses there. The word of our God this morning is recorded two chapters later in Romans chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. We have those verses printed for you and up on the screens. Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. And just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. That's all. In the name of the God who loved the world so much that he sent his one and only son to become a sacrifice of sin for you and for me and for the world. I've said it several times. I don't know if it was something that you caught or something that went in one ear and out the other. I've stated that if you and I didn't have any other book in the Bible, we didn't have a precious privilege that we have in the book called the Bible. And what a precious privilege it is. And perhaps maybe we need to stop right now and thank the Lord for that precious privilege. And remember that it's a stewardship we need to be using it like it is a precious privilege. Okay? But if we had didn't have our Bibles. We only had one book, the book of Romans. We would still have enough information from the revealed knowledge of God to know the problem that you and I have as, as a sinful mankind. And we would also know the remedy to that malady of sin. We would know that it is through the work and the person of God's Son, Jesus Christ. Let's go one step further. Let's say that we didn't even have the book of Romans. We only had the chapter that's before us today, chapter 5. Or perhaps we only had two verses from God's wisdom given to us that we call the revealed knowledge of God. Two verses. The verses before us this morning. That would still be enough. Wisdom from God and I. Let us know what our problem is. The problem that mankind has. The problem of sin. And we would still know what the remedy to that malady is. To the problem of sin. It would still be the person and work of God's Son, Jesus Christ. The Bible contains many lessons, messages, prescriptions, advice, teachings and doctrines. But you and I know from our catechism classes that of all those messages, of all the information in God's Word, there are two main messages that you and I need to devotely highlight and put in the spotlight and keep up here in our heads and our hearts. Let's take a look at a reminder of what those two main messages are this morning. Messages that, that surely remind you and me of mankind's universal problem. And a message that also reminds us what the Lord did to remedy that universal problem of sin. The Apostle Paul summarized the entire first part of his book to the Romans, a doctrinal book, the first part, by summarizing it with two 
main messages. You and I know them as the law, which is zeroed in on and, and spotlighted from verses 1, chapter 1, verse 18, all the way through chapter 20, chapter 3, verse, verse 20. The first part of the book of Romans focuses on God's law and the consequences for everyone who does not keep that law entirely and fulfill it perfectly. And of course, you and I call that the bad news and, and somewhat harsh news, especially when you look at the first couple chapters of the book of Romans. The second message reveals what we call the good news. The good news of what the Lord has done for us in the person and work of Christ Jesus. And that is, is focused on chapter 3, verse 21, all the way through chapter 5, verse 11, just, to, just before our section this morning. In the section before us this morning, chapter 5, verses 12 through 19, particularly verses 18 and 19, the verses before us, we hear about those two messages summarized, and Paul summarizes them by pointing out the two messages by contrasting two different individuals, two different men. Let's take a look at that message one more time, contrasted in the two verses with two different characters or men. We hear verses 18 and 19, the words before us this morning one more time. So it's consequently, just as the result of the one, talking about one man, the result of, of the one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of the one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. The two messages, the two main messages of God's word are contrasted with two individuals in the words before us, the verses before us this morning. The first person, the first character, the first man is a guy by the name of Adam. You know Adam as the first human being who was created by the Lord way back in the beginning. It was Adam and Eve who actually fell into sin and, and were responsible for the problem of, 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 the, of falling into sin uh, that this world now is affected by. And of course, Adam was the one blamed because he was the one responsible. And so the Lord blamed Adam for sin. So again, we hear that Adam is the one who trespassed and brought condemnation for not just a couple of people, or most people, but for all men. It was Adam whose disobedience, the many were made sinful. Because Adam sinned, his, the consequences of his sin were passed down to his sons and to their sons, all the way down to you and me. We call that original sin. We call that hereditary sin. That liability and condemnation, the consequences of sin, has been passed down to every single one of us. It has affected every single person in this world. We heard that when, when, we, when we heard those words uh, of verses 18 and 9. Condemnation for all men. We're included in all men. The many were made sinners. We are sinners as well. This is the reason why Paul wrote what he did earlier in chapter, chapter 5, verse 12, the beginning of this section, when he wrote, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, Adam, and death came, death through sin, and in this way death came to all men, because all sin. And even earlier in chapter 3, there is no difference, for all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. Paul's message here, summarized with verses 18 and 19, 
uh, with the person or character by the name of Adam tells us that because he sinned and that sin has been passed down to all people, all people are also condemned by the just and holy God. And there are no exceptions to this. No wonder Paul also quoted Psalm 14 in chapter 3 of Romans when he said, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who does good, not even one. And that's bad news, isn't it? That's sad news. That's news that you and I don't like to hear because it includes you and me. But that's only one message, isn't it? Thanks be to God that there is a second message, another message. And the other message is given to us in 18 and 19 as well. The second half of each verse. We hear, so also the result of the one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. So also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. Here we hear, contrasted with the first character, Adam, and what he did, we hear the exact opposite in the person and work of Jesus. Just as what Adam did, he, he sinned and he disobeyed, and that brought condemnation to all men. So also what Jesus did, he didn't sin. He was perfect. He was righteous. He lived a perfect life, never sinned once, and he was not disobedient, but he was obedient. We'll talk about the, the two obediences, not just one, but for the time being, his obedience as referred to as his passive obedience. That is what also benefited or blessed all people, brought justification for all men. This is a pretty good summary, and I highlighted it for myself, is that Adam was responsible for the problem of sin resulting in a universal condemnation. Jesus was responsible for the solution to the problem of sin and is responsible for the re resulting universal justification for all mankind. Messages are the two main messages of God's Word. These two messages, law and gospel, are the most important messages that you and I will hear and read and learn and believe and obey and share with, with not just our family but with everybody else. They're two most important messages. Every single one of us needs to be reminded of these messages every single day, lest we forget either of them. You and I dare not do what many people have done with that first message, the message of God's holy law. Because it is, it is bad news, sad news, news that, that we just don't enjoy hearing. Many people just simply ignore it. They just simply uh, don't even listen to it. They eject it completely from their memory banks because they just don't like what it says. But fortunately for you and for me, you and I need to be reminded of this message day in and day out. And fortunately for also you and me, remembering the first message, the message of God's holy law, uh, is, is a message that you and I don't really need the written reminder of God's word in other words, we don't need to pick up God's word to, to remember God's law, do we? Because we can see God's law all around us. You see, our world is also affected by sin. We aren't the only people. And everybody else in the world is affected by sin. So we see the effects of sin all around us. We don't need to pick up God's word and, and be reminded of the fact that Mankind is sinful. Mankind is cursed. Mankind is headed for tragedy in eternity. You and I can see that all around us. The world along with its entire population, in 
affected by sin affects us by that painting. Or wars and rumors of wars, which is what we are experiencing right now with all this, this, this uh, war going on, Russia and Ukraine. Hatred and racism. Crime and just plain lust and evil. Famine and disease. Sickness and death. These are all reminders that you and I are, li are not living in a perfect world, but a world that has been infected by sin. And it affects you and me. It reminds you and me every day that we too are not perfect, that we are sinners living in a sinful world. They don't call this world a veil of tears or nothing. But what you and I do need to remember is, is that not only that we're sinful, that we're living in a sinful world, and the consequences and the liability and the effects of sin, but we need to remember that there's nothing that you and I can do about it. There's not one thing that you and I can do about our malady, the problem of sin, by ourselves. And that's really the purpose of God's law, to show you and me that we're sinful so that you and I have to say, hmm, looks like I need a Savior outside of myself because I certainly can't save myself. I need a Savior who really can save me. The law does not show us that Savior. But the law shows us that we need a Savior other than ourselves. And that really is the blessing and the purpose of the second message of God's Word. That second message of God's Word tells us what you and I need to know about the Savior. Yes, the God-man. The person who, who was sent by a God that loved the world so much that he sent his Son. And it tells us about what that son did. He came to solve our problem of sin. And not just a few people's problem, but all mankind. He came to solve that problem by, first of all, living perfectly. Never sinning once. He fulfilled all of God's laws. And now by faith, we get that righteousness applied to your account and mine. What a marvelous act of God's grace. But that's not the only thing he did. Lived perfectly for us to fulfill all righteousness so that you and I could have righteousness and be righteous. But he also allowed himself to be nailed to a cross on Calvary upon which he obeyed his heavenly father and became the atoning sacrifice for every one of your sins, for every one of my sins, for every single sin that has ever been done by every single person in the world who has lived, who is living now, or whoever will live. And it is this passive obedience that we are renewing and reviewing and refreshing our memories with during the Wednesdays of Lent in the passion history of our Savior Jesus. Jesus willingly drank the cup of suffering as I said last week, the full cup of suffering, not just, a, not just a sip of it. He drank the full cup of suffering that his Father will for you and for me. And the result is, for all mankind, we've been acquitted of our sin. We've been redeemed by our Savior Jesus. Paul wrote here, through his obedience of many will be made righteous. Some of you know that I don't care for that translation. Those of you who come to Bible class, that is, know that I don't really like that translation. Sad to say, most modern translations today translate it made righteous. Horrible. Well, it's not really a horrible translation. I'm convinced that the Apostle Paul was inspired by the Holy Spirit to use the same verb in the second part of that verse as he did with the first part. Just as Adam and what he did made people sinners, Paul used the same verb. Made people to be something. That's what the verb means. Made people to be something. But... Being made righteous, it just is so confusing 
And it really upsets me because um, most people, when they read that, are very confused. Because that's not what happens. Justification doesn't make people righteous. Justification does not make anyone righteous. It will never change your spots, your character, or your person. It doesn't do anything to you. And that's the problem that that translation gives. People are made righteous. Denominations use that for their, their error in their theology. You and I need to be cautious of the confusion that that translation can give because people are not made righteous by justification. You, you and I need to remember what justification is. Catechism question, isn't it? Justification is an oral proclamation. It is a judicial decree of a just judge pronouncing somebody not guilty. Okay? It is not making somebody not guilty. That's the point that I'm trying to make. And that's the point that's very confusing with that translation. People are not made not guilty. The Heavenly Father declares us to be not guilty. Yes, the Father is the one that looks at us who are sinful and guilty as anything. But he looks at us through the blood of Jesus Christ, shed for you and for me, shed for the world, shed for everybody. And he looks at you and me through that blood, and he no longer sees our sins, he sees his son's blood. And he looks at you and me as if we are now perfect like his son. Because Jesus has taken away our imperfections. He's taken away our unrighteousnesses. He has taken away everything that, that could make us the forfeit spending eternal life with him in heaven. And he looks at us as being perfect. To him we are all like Jesus, God's one and only son. It's not that we are like Jesus. We're far from it, aren't we? At least I know that I am. We still sin, don't we? Every single day, we daily sin. But the good news is that Heavenly Father looks at you and me as if we're perfect. As if we're not guilty of sin. All thanks to what Jesus has done for us. That is a tremendous gift. Folks, you and I need to recognize that. And justification is a tremendous gift that the Lord has given to us. He looks at you and me as if we haven't done what we actually have done. All because he's looking at you and me through the glasses of his son's precious blood shed on Calvary's cross. There are a lot of messages in God's word. Messages like what the triune God is like, his character. That's where we learn who the true God is and what he has done for us in the first work of Jesus Christ. God's word tells us what we need to do. And can do to love our Lord with all our hearts and life. Tells us what you and I need to remember to do and not do in order to love our fellow man. Like we love ourselves. It tells us what we are to avoid. Like the plague. If you and I are being led by the Spirit, we're not going to do this. But if we're being led by our sinful old flesh, well then, that's what we will be doing. There's a lot of messages, a lot of, of advice a lot of prescriptions, a lot of lessons in God's Word. But we don't call the law and the gospel the two most important messages for nothing. We need to remember that the law and the gospel are the most important messages, and we need to remember those messages because remembering the first message of the law shows us our sin and our need for a Savior reminds us that we constantly need that, that reminder of a Savior outside of us. Because we have a problem all thanks to Adam, don't we? But remembering that second message also remembers Jesus active in his past obedience for us. His solution to our problem of sin. Yes, and it's also remembering that message that motivates and enables and empowers us to keep our faith alive. And it's actually that gospel message, the second message of God's word that is alone responsible for keeping you 
and be subjectively justified. May we all use every opportunity to hear, study, learn, believe, and treasure these two vital messages that God's Word reveals to us. Amen. Let's arise and sing the offertory. We find it on page 20 at the top of the page.
us in our last hours that, so that death will hold no terror for us. Lord, should it be that you choose to test our faith by laying a cross upon us, give us the grace to bear it patiently, fill us with joy in knowing that we are counted worthy to suffer hardship for your name. To the frailty of our nature and part your strength, grant that our souls will ever find in you full cleansing, perfect healing, lasting peace. To the glory of your holy name, we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We continue our worship on the top of page 21. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Yeah. 